we um, may get on to underway because we have um, a bit more to cover today than what we did yesterday. So welcome back to everybody who um, is joining us again after yesterday. Um, for new people, um, welcome to this uh, webinar series on the, um, the Fishmore trade. Um, just to, <coughs> sorry, since yesterday I've come down with a cold. Um, just as a quick recap, um, yesterday we had presentations from Brian Smith and Elizabeth Mansur from Wildlife Conservation Society from Bangladesh, who looked at some of the threatened species interactions between the uh, the take or the, the fishing methods used to take fish for more. Um, we had a presentation from Claire Gorman from IUCN, who did an overview of the status of the cyanid family. After that, we had a presentation from one of our steering committee members, Simone Liu, from uh, Traffic in South Africa, who also covered some of her field work in, in Cameroon. And lastly, we had a short presentation from me about um, the use of fish more in icing glass for um, beer and wine. So just a uh, uh, yes, uh, Kim, we can provide you with a, um, a copy of the presentations from yesterday and, and welcome today. Um, so just a quick recap of um, why we why we're here. Um, there was a um, a steering group comprising Yvonne Sadovi, Simone Liu, and Jeff Kinch and myself put together a proposal for this workshop series on, on Fishmore to two funders, ADM Capital Foundation from Hong Kong, and then also the Sustainable Fisheries and Communities Trust from, from the UK. Uh, ADM has had a long history of being involved in fisheries issues, particularly in Asia. Um, SFACT, or the Sustainable Fisheries and Communities Trust, is a, a small and new trust that focuses on small scale and community fisheries, and they're currently funding the development of a small scale fisheries certification program called Community Catch. So as yesterday, um, There'll be a, a short introduction um, from myself, and then we'll have um, two presentations. I better just check that. Um, yes, that's true. Um, two presentations first off. Um, each presentation will be um, 20 minutes, followed by a five minute um, quick clarification question session. Um, after the two presentations, there'll be a short um, tea and comfort break of 15 minutes. And we then have three presentations, again, the same format, 20 minutes presentation with a um, <clears throat> five minute question and answer session. And then at the end of the webinar, there'll be um, provision for about half an hour for a, a wider discussion about the um, all the presentations that we've had today. So to keep on time, I am going to hand over to Professor Yvonne Sadovi from Hong Kong University. Um, Yvonne, do you want to introduce yourself, please? And then also, um, load your presentation. I think it might be being done by um, by, by Liberty or Nadia. And just, <coughs> just briefly, um, before we um, move, we have two IT experts to help us. If anybody has any problems, <coughs> please um, um, raise your hand and um, we can get somebody to, to help you. So um, Yvonne, I shall hand over to you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Duncan. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, wherever you are across the world. At the moment, I'm in London, so I have a pretty easy ride. It's about eight o'clock in the morning. Um, I'm going to stop my video um, during the talk because the connection I have here is a little bit unstable. So it's probably best if I switch off the video and then I'll come back 
um, and look at you, uh, or you can look at me <laughs> at the end of the talk. So I'm going to do that now and I'll start. So um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to talk about <clears throat> the more trade because it's something that I personally uh, learned about maybe a decade ago when I had students doing work on uh, fish more in Hong Kong. And we noticed that there were many more shops opening in parts of Hong Kong that were selling large quantities of more. They just became more obvious. The talk I'm going to give today is really it's an overview. There are other speakers who are going to give detailed presentations of aspects of this talk. But the idea is that it's an overview of the uses, destinations and trends in the fish more trade, at least as far as we know it at the moment. And as I think we're all realizing, there are many gaps um, in our understanding of this trade globally. So next slide, please. We go to the next slide. Um, when I think of a swim bladder, no, I'm sorry, the one before. Thank you. When I think of a swim bladder, I think of an amazing structure in a fish, which enables it to have neutral buoyancy through an incredible uh, physiological mechanism and also gives it a voice in a sense because many species, including many of the species in the moor trade, use their swim bladder to create sound. So my, my coming in image of swim bladders is, is somewhat different from, from, from a lot of people, I think, in the way in which we have taken this swim bladder and put it to use, to our use. Next slide, please. And I have two slides on the uses. And these range from medicinal, and these are tonic foods and, and healing. And I'll give a little bit more information in a minute about these. Culinary, so uh, for eating food, particularly we're seeing it um, increasingly as treated as a luxury seafood. Gelatin is used in food, pharmaceuticals, uh, for example, capsules uh, covering pills. Beauty, it's an area that uh, we're seeing more and more use of bladder in particular in some parts of the world. Um, and that's really linked to the collagen um, in the swim bladder uh, in relation to skin of that collagen on skin. And then Isinglass, uh, Duncan yesterday, very long time, been used um, in several, it's also been used to create and also to mend China. And these last three, the furniture, parchment and China, um, it's very difficult to, to kind of work out or to know how much uh, Isinglass is still used for those purposes. Next slide, please. So this, if you take this picture going from the right to the left, on the right, you can see a range of moors. Most of the uh, images in that picture, except for the shark fin at the top left of the right hand image are different types of moors. So quite a range of sizes. And with those are going to be quite a range of prices. If we go clockwise around this picture, you see soup um, that's very, very widely sold. Um, uh, particularly in East Asia. You've got various packages there, um, uh, various kinds of uh, sort of beauty products for which you make soup, for example. The bottom left shows a uh, someone who's using fish more to make ising glass for beer. And on the left-hand middle, this shows part of an experiment in, in which the more has been uh, aspects of the more have been extracted and it's used for healing um, skin grafts, um, also healing internally on the heart. And there's quite a few recent papers um, where swim bladder extracts have been used for these various kinds of medical purposes. Next slide, please. So the uses <clears throat> may be expanding. The second of two slides of uses is we're seeing because of the high value of some species of moor and particularly large size ones, we're seeing these money moors, which are high value moor. Um, and there are indications that there's speculation, um, obviously associated with investment, not surprisingly, but that this, some of this could include money laundering. And when we're talking about prices, 
some of the top prices are in the tens, even hundreds of thousands of US dollar for one more. I mean, these are the very top ones, but just to give you an idea of how, how high a value some of these mores can have. They're also used sometimes as wedding gifts um, because they are um, recognized widely as having high value. A shark fin is used less, particularly by younger people in weddings. In um, Hong Kong, for example, uh, high value uh, more can replace shark fin. Uh, and as I say, uh, most of the higher value are large and thick, and most of the higher value, not all, are croakers, the family cyanidae. Historically, uh, more uh, extract has been used for egg preservative. I don't know about today and historically uh, used as condoms um, in Europe. Next slide, please. And this slide shows a number of pictures going from the right. So these are very high value um, examples. So the top right is about 64,000 US dollars, uh, that left hand one. And that was just sort of hanging on a wall in one of the shops in, in Hong Kong. And, and there were many such examples. Uh, below that, you can see shark fin in amongst different types of more and kind of highlighting the, the high value. In the middle, you can see more, um, which is then displayed together with abalone, sea cucumbers, and other high value products. On the upper left, as an example, probably of Toto Aba, um, which went for very high value. And down below that, uh, a of condoms that went on sale at an auction. Um, apparently these are reusable, washable, and um, are attached with a string. I'll leave you to think about that. Next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide? slide. All right, so I'm gonna talk about trends. And I'll talk about trends in terms of volumes and prices species and sources, production and practices, use and marketing and threats. Next slide, please. So if we look at volumes and prices, um, the information that we have is limited to just a few species of fisheries, and we can use these to get some idea of these trends. In general, the indications are that trade has increased, particularly in the last decade or so, and that's sort of consistent with what we noted in Hong Kong, with an, this increase in shops, some of them even dedicated just to selling fish more. So there is a, there is a suggestion that this increase has been the large increase, um, and maybe this is why our, our attention was has been attracted, that there has been an increase within, within this period. Next slide, please. So I'm, I'm not gonna cover this in detail, Stan will talk more about this, but the only database that I know of that specifically monitors fish more is the Hong Kong database since 2015, which separated more from other dried fish. And since 2015, it's, it's been roughly stable uh, between three and 4,000 metric tons a year. Um, but this is much higher than historically. Um, there are other kind of an not anecdotal accounts and kind of one-off studies where only a few hundred tons would be, were recorded, at least in Hong Kong. Next slide, please. Um, there are a few more detailed studies. Again, you'll see that most of these increases in these graphs um, are since the last decade or so, since around 2010. So there's the Nile perch, Lattes niloticus in the top one, increase in volume and price. The other two are Protonibia diacanthus, the black spotted grouper in Australia. And the middle picture shows the increase in Queensland catch. That's the one that goes along the bottom and then increases. New territory catch declines with its price increasing. That's the light blue and the yellow. And finally, in Kuwait, we also see an increase in catch, quite a large one in the last decade, and an increase in price. So in many places, we're seeing these kinds of trends um, in terms of time and prices. Next slide, please. Um, I want to kind of highlight some something, which I will <clears throat> continue in the next little section. So this 
Here's a graph that shows the price in US dollars per kilogram at retail for different classes of more. And as the point was made yesterday, more is not sold by species, it's sold by category, you could say, or trade name. So yellow, fried fish, etc. These are sort of various trade names. And you can see a couple of things in this graph. The first is how much, how variable the price can be for certain types of more. Also how variable the actual mean price can be. That's the sort of square in the middle of the, of the vertical bars, of course. Um, and also, and I'll, I'll come on to this, uh, we, we're seeing new species coming into the market, new compared to historically used species. So for example, upper left is Bursamia, which is a croaker, spider more, very distinctive shape. And that is the, include the very top values, valued species. It includes the kind of more commonly traded species, very variable. And then on the right hand side picture is Latias nihiloticus, which is the Nile perch. And it's sold sometimes as golden dragon in the middle there, or as grass sea bass. So uh, the two middle, the two left hand red stars, you see variability in price. Sometimes these are sold as croaker. So with the naming, there's a variation in naming and quite a variation in price, even for the same um, species. Next slide, please. All right, and species and sources. So I've, I've covered a little bit of that already, but um, what we know about species in trade has been variously documented based on DNA in, in the retail centers and on some fisheries work in source countries. But generally we don't know much about sources for many species. And these species are mostly croakers, but also catfish, puffer fish, eels, polynemids, which are thread fins, and also um, the Nile perch, Lattes nilotics, and other Lattes species. Next slide, please. Next slide. Now, some increase in the species diversity um, has uh, the previous one, <laughs> please. <laughs> I think we're going at different speeds. I think there's maybe a time lag, like the previous one, please. Okay, so some increase in species has occurred, and I've given two examples in the previous graph. Amongst all of those species, the croakers are still the highest value. Um, you know, or, or other uses in particularly in East Asia, but of course there's a long history of use. Um, there's a long history of use uh, as Ising glass, and uh, that is uh, it, it inclu it includes many countries. I think uh, Belgium and Austria were reported. Certainly in the UK, North America, Ising glass is used for a wide range of um, uh, to produce a wide range of products. What we don't know is sort of what happens to the fish more after it leaves the fish? Is it, is it, uh, is Ising glass produced in other countries and then sent to where the processing um, um, for um, alcohol is, for example? Or we know very, very little about um, the Ising glass, you know, how the trade in, in the different components of Ising glass um, from, from source to destination. Uh, next slide, please. And the next one. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I'll stop. I'll stop on this one. So, with the glass, um, we also have a little bit of an idea of which species they come from. Um, possibly a whole range of croakers. We don't know, but also cod, ling, hake, and other species. But where country, where, where, the, where the trade is coming from, the darkest images in this, or the darkest countries in this graph, are where the highest volumes of trade are coming from, of more, into Hong Kong. This is just the Hong Kong-based trade, and, and Stan will talk more about this. But the only point I wanted to make here is that more is sourced 
for whatever uses from a very wide range of countries, over a hundred are already recorded. And that's only trade into Hong Kong. So this is a glo truly a global trade. Next, please. All right, so production and practices. The means of producing more are changing. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, but what we're seeing, and examples are given in other talks, is that fishing practices are sometimes being modified to increase catches of more. And this can lead to incidental catch of threatened megafauna, which are of some concern. Next slide, please. All right. So in terms of production, modern technologies can remove or replace more from processing to some extent. To what extent that change is occurring, we don't know. But very interestingly, Guinea, uh, a big beer producing company, uh, has actually removed more from its beer refining due to concerns from vegans who did not want to have animal products in their beer. And then finally, aquaculture production is increasing or being the target of that production, especially in the croakers. But it doesn't reduce overfishing. People are still fishing for, for more. So aquaculture are concerned about because of their impacts on the target and the non-target structures. In this next slide. Thank you. Um, what you can see here is you can see top left is this shows Guinness removes fish guts. They're talking about more, by the way, from its recipe. Um, and then on the right hand side, you've got uh, an example of a former chief executive who's visited a fish farm. And this farm was funded in Hong Kong to produce a species for its more through aquaculture. And at the lower one, um, uh, I think we see some from Taiwan, there's a lot of work, they've done a lot of work on aquaculture, and certainly there's a lot of interest to culture croaker because of the high value more. Next, please. All right, so in terms of practices, we see for certain valued species that more has become the target, not the byproduct. And this is important when understanding fisheries and the value of the fisheries. Sometimes the, if there's a glut of fish, um, then the more is taken and the flesh may actually be discarded. And there are a few examples of this. We also see examples of shifts in gear use. Um, for example, in India, changes in net mesh size to catch croaker reduces the traditional pelagic catch and also results in increased endangered bycatch. So this is obviously a concern. Another trend has been begin, beginning, I guess, to try to regulate at the national level, uh, the more trade to control the pricing and, and to gain more of the value. So if we go to the next slide, we're going to see a few examples of articles. Uh, and this is Uganda, this is for the Nile perch. Uh, fairly recently, they're seeking to regulate the more trade. They see the high value. They see that the money that the country could get much better value have become aware of the more trade. It was somewhat secretive until more recently, but now the value is becoming more widely known. Um, and one of the important things that a country like Uganda uh, needs, is considering is to try to process them more in the country because that's a value adding process. So we're talking about value adding within country to bring more value of the more to the country and hopefully a, a bigger incentive for the country to manage its more. Um, and so this, this is an issue because uh, many traders are wanting to export unprocessed more um, and, and so there are, th these, are, these are opportunities for controlling the trade and gaining more value in the source country. Next one, please. Next slide. All right, increasing more use. We're seeing more being marketed very heavily more recently. 
as a beauty product, uh, as I mentioned, because of its collagen. There's a very marked increase in fancy packaging uh, in the supermarket, for example, and, and in online sales. Uh, when I was first in Hong Kong several decades ago, we would never see more in packages. Now we see them in supermarkets, not just in dried fish um, areas of the city um, and, and uh, fancily packed. And as I mentioned, um, there's a trend uh, as, as, as moving, uh, as shark fin uh, is, is less used by young people, uh, there's an increased use of high value seafood, one of them being more, for the weddings to replace shark food. And as I mentioned, investment um, is something we're learning about. Next, please. So a few pictures here. On the right-hand side, this is the packaging um, that, that we see in supermarkets. So these are in little plastic boxes. Historically, you would have seen something more like the left-hand side where you've got um, uh, a kind of a display, but, but dried uh, together, but not in packaging like that. Next slide, please. So I've just got, got a couple more slides. Um, and here, the packaging, you can see a little bit more detail. This is quite fancy, advertising, et cetera. And again, sort of these, I've shown you these pictures before, but this is kind of part of the, part of the collection of high value, high value or beauty products um, that are uh, sold uh, for, as more. Next slide, please. All right, finally, threats. Um, you'll hear more about that uh, from others, but some species are more vulnerable to overfishing, uh, ones that uh, produce more um, due to longevity, and that's often in, uh, linked to size, and larger fish are often more valuable because of their larger more. When they're caught at spawning aggregations, which is uh, quite a few of the croakers certainly are, and when they have a limited geographic range. Um, and some species are endangered for more either being targeted directly as the focus species or indirectly, as I say, the, the unwanted incidental megafauna bycatch. Next slide. And then a couple of concluding slides. All right, so just this gives you five, I want to uh, six species and their range, how small their range is. The Bahaba, left-hand side, very small geographic range in China. And the other species in this, um, you've got a, uh, a croaker in the middle, you've got a catfish at the bottom, you've got a lattice on the right lower, and you've got totoaba on the right upper. All of these have very small geographic ranges, which are, which means that these are very vulnerable to overfishing. <clears throat> but it's not just the small range species. On the top, you've got Protonibia of diacanthus, wide geographic range, but concern about the species in quite a few areas within that range, which is marked by the yellow spots. Next, please. And I'll be concluded. And finally, destinations, not much to say really. Destinations generally are poorly known. Uh, we know East and Southeast Asia from the Hong Kong trade, but clearly European countries, North America amongst others, um, either receiving more directly or indirectly after processing for ising glass and other products. So very little known about the trade outside of um, East Asia. And that's something we really need to know more about as destinations here. All right, next slide, please. All right, two slides to finish on conclusions. So one of the things that we clearly need to do is to document the value and volume of the more trade. Um, and maybe we could use the Hong Kong harmonized code, uh, which has been in place since 2015, and also local knowledge. You know, local fishermen are gonna know uh, what's going on uh, to some extent. Divert more value to fishers by knowing the value chain and source country processing of more, drying of more, for example. There are opportunities for identifying more that comes from sustainably operated fisheries, maybe ones that are already MSC certified, maybe from COD, for example, and some of the others. And clearly there's a need to protect consumers from mislabeling of more species. I mean, they're not sold by species uh, and sometimes uh, more is sold as a higher value species like a croaker when it comes from a historically lower value species like lattes. Um, and next, just go to the second slide. So two slides on these concluding observations to do. Next one, please. Yes, thank you. All right. So. Um, 
clearly, and this would be echoed in other talks, we need to be managing some of these more vulnerable species and fisheries. Um, could you go back to that last slide, please? We need to be managing these, especially the more valuable ones. Um, some of the larger croakers and the aggregating species really do need special attention, it seems. We need to manage the fisheries to reduce wastage of flesh where that does occur, which it does occasionally, uh, and to keep the value in, um, in country and find ways could be gear, gear or time controls to reduce incidental catch of vulnerable, threatened, um, non-target species. And in a way, I think we have an opportunity to get ahead of the curve in the sense that we understand what the market is interested in. Although of course, uses are always changing. So we have to be aware of that. Um, uh, so for example, we know large, uh, large species, uh, thick uh, swim bladder, these types of things. These are the kind of things that could help us maybe predict where the next targets might be and, and to get ahead of the curve before uh, maybe business interests become too strong um, to make management much more difficult. Okay, uh, and last, and last, go to the last one. The only slide I slipped, uh, just before I say thank you, the only slide I slipped past was just, uh, it was uh, a motion which was accepted to IU, by IUCN and, and its members to really look into the more trade, thank you, um, to control and monitor the more trade. This, this went uh, in, uh, this was accepted in 2021. And so there is a wider recognition and acknowledgement already that we need to be looking at this trade and understanding it better and um, bringing it under some kind of control to, to sustain these species. All right, now I say thank you. Um, Yvonne, that was a um, really great start to um, today's session and exactly what I think we were looking for to sort of give an right. overview. And so really appreciate that. I can see some clapping hands and thumbs up rising from the bottom. <laughs> of the Thank so, you. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so can I just ask briefly um, if anybody has any um, quick questions? Um, I think that um, maybe, so there's two questions in the chat box, one of them about puffer fish and consumer safety. The second thing, a second one is about um, MSC certification. Um, maybe um, when we can either have these as discussion items later on, or if you've got any quick comments, then um, yes, um, look forward to your thoughts, and then we could move on to our second. I think also Kim has his hand up as well. So, um, yeah, over to you. Uh, thanks very okay, much. Okay, so Yvonne, very was... briefly, um, fish. I, I can't actually. Sorry. Yeah, you keep breaking up, Yvonne. Um, the question was saying that the fish moors contain the tetroda toxin, which often a lot of puffer fishes do. And so the question was how to identify and regulate uh, puffer fish moors to ensure consumer safety. Um, but I do see that uh, Bailin is typing an answer to that one. Um, the second question um, was about the, um, the challenge of um, entering certification through through MSC. Uh, the, only, the only thing I wanted to say about the MSC is, you know, it, it, there are many MSC certified fisheries, and maybe more is already coming from some of these. So these might be kind of golden opportunities in a sense. I'm only proposing this. I don't know that that's true. Um, but then, you know, obviously MSC certification can, could apply to other fisheries too. But that was really the point I was trying to make that we may already have those opportunities. It's just it's a matter of putting the, you know, putting the, pulling the dots together, joining the dots, maybe. So I think yeah. I interrupted Kim. Yes. Uh, Kim?
Thanks, Yvonne. That was really great. I just <clears throat> just was quite fascinated when we saw the map of where the movement's coming from, because it looks like it. Obviously, there's places like Totoaba areas where these more have come for a while and such like, but it's very patchy, even though the fish themselves aren't as patchy. <laughs> and it's that, that that's kind of unusual because, uh, you know, if we take the sea cucumber, for example, yes, yeah, sure, new areas open up, but generally the areas are quite well covered. Just thinking, do you think that's just a matter of the skill that's required and the local experts that have to be there to, to help to drum up that trade in that particular spot of the world? Or, or what, how do you think that's happened? Yeah, yeah, I, it is interesting, Kim. Um, well, I think there's been an expansion in from 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 what we know historically of the species use, which was historically a very small number of species. So, the sum increase in number of species used, a range of species used, so that is coming from a wider range of areas. I think it does have to do with connections, networks, uh, you know, business networks, those types of things. Often, the dried more trade um, is also done in tandem with say other dried products. So there may be networks already in dried seafood areas, which might determine some of those, um, some of the countries or parts of countries that are that are approached um, and start trading. So I think it's, a, my, my guess is it's a combination of increase, increase generally, networking um, and opportunity. But, it, but it's definitely something we need to understand more about. Thank you. Okay, I think we um, might close this off and we can cover a lot of the present, uh, 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 questions later on. Um, Stan, we have a um, presentation from you, um, if you're able to um, load that up, please. Um, so I just want to give a brief, while you're doing that, I'm just going to, um, I've just lost my source of information. Um, so Stan, Stan uh, is employed by Bloom in the in, in in Hong Kong, and been very much involved as a keen diver and and marine educator. Um, he um, has a, a a master's of philosophy degree from um, and with the University of Hong Kong School of Biological Sciences. He's um, been working on a lot of these. Um, dried foods um, and also wet market surveys for live reef fish um, for, for many years. Um, he co-founded a um, uh, the Hong Kong Reef Fish Survey Project. And, um, and so, you know, that data has been used to um, help, you know, the uh, IUCN's group on RAS assessments. <coughs> Sorry. Um, He's really interested in making conservation more topics more accessible to people from all sorts of life. And um, he does a lot of education work with anybody from uh, corporates to government officials and schools and kindergartens. So Stan, happy to hand over to you. Really keen to hear what, what you've been finding out. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. And also, um, thank you, Professor Sdofi. You gave a perfect opening for me, so I don't have to go into all the details to talk about the Hong Kong. So you already have a really good like, background for everyone to understand. And so I'll be actually responsible for talking about what we do know in Hong Kong and the situation and what me, we may want to know, not, not what we don't know, but what we may want to know. So, um, so I think Yvonne was mentioning, um, basically, um, it harmonized like Coke. So it is an international standard uh, under the WCO, World Custom Organization. So, and then Hong Kong has to follow certain rules, but also because of the trade is so diverse and different products. So Hong Kong also has like the authority to design the actual description. So you won't mention 2015. So actually before, if you look at the custom code, so before the fish mold was actually lumped into head, tails, moles, and other edible fish things, and either they were fresh or chilled, frozen, smoked it, or like, um, yeah, or dried it like before. So before 
2015, most of the fish more like they were lumped in different categories. So it was really difficult to actually to actually simply understand what's happening for only the more trade. So not until 2015. And then the cook gets separated by the government. So now we are actually looking mainly, Yvonne was presenting the 3,000 tons was just talking about dry fish more trade. So one thing to bear in mind here, I'm also talking about the dry fish more trade. And then we have to also um, be aware that we might be estimated. And that that's definitely because some of the more could be farming, coming in frozen form or in brine solution, or they were in different like types of, but we just couldn't separate out of those data. So, um, so Iman also like talk about, yes, around like from since 2015 to 2021 is about 3,000 to 4,000 metric tons per year, only in 2018. But we also have to bear in mind when we look at the trade, when we say it's similar around 3,000 metric tons per year. But if we look at 2019, 2020, 2021, that it was really a sad year, which is a pandemic, they might, they might also affecting the trade and also affecting the logistic. So the reported rare yields average is about 200 million US dollars per uh, yes per year. And this is the reported import value only. And also we have to be very careful when interpreting in when using those numbers because one also like based on experience, some of the trade that they also put logistics price into the reported import value and some may not. So that is not helpful. And the other thing is um also the values is range from like 200 million to three 300 million and then we have to also bear in mind the volume so the volume fluctuator which is also called the total imported value of fluctuator so that's something we have to remember but as Imon mentioned it's actually very good to take it as a reference and to see the trend to understand the situation and this is not a graph for you to actually understand the graph, to see the graph, to interpret the graph. This is actually to show you the scale. So Yvonne mentioned, so up to today, 2015 to 2021, there were about at least reported import, like places reported where is the source for the Hong Kong dry fish mall, around 111 countries or like area. So that's just to give you an idea. So 111 for the past since 2015 and if I just shuffle around I just use top six um, reported import places as a sources so you can see these six places are actually covering around 63 percent of the total volume of the trade and the highest I mean you can I mean if you need any breakdown or details are more than happy to help but this one just easier for you to understand because I saw from Yvonne's previous like um slide was saying like 10 countries or 10 places can cover 75 percent I mean that's like there's no contract but I just take up like the first six um so and also the reason why the first six is like um if you look at Brazil Uganda they're actually taking about almost 30 percent of the total volume trade and then for Tanzania that is about 10 percent and then for Vietnam about nine percent and then the other two Indonesia India is about five percent of the total volume so um that's the other thing apart from the breakdown these countries that we might want to look at or the situation of for the dry more and also we have to remember this is like the country of origin Region. So for the trade data, what does that mean is like the country of reported the origin of the product was processing or made to like before coming our well, end ups in Hong Kong. And I also want to show you the, um, the country of consignment. So what does country of consignment means? Country of consignment, which means the product like from the last port of departure to directly to Hong Kong. So which means if they are saying from Brazil, that's definitely the shipment is directly from Brazil to Hong Kong, not using Brazil to America, America to Hong Kong. So that could be also, that's kind of like re-export transshipment happen. But when we use the country of consignment, we actually see the direct shipment, how, well, and um, where are they from direct depart to Hong Kong. So if we actually look at the country of origin, you can see Brazil, Uganda, Tanzania, Vietnam, and then which is the top four. But if we look at the country of consignment, Vietnam actually overtake like Tanzania as the third place. So we don't know why, but you can see that's the advantage of playing around this trade data and actually help you to understand something. So maybe we will find out something, but you can see by using the volume, Vietnam actually overtake um, Tanzania as the country of consignment place to Hong Kong. So total re-export, um, total re-export reported 
um, re-export values average about 15 million US per year. And you can see basically from 2015, there was a decline trend. And then um, from, if you remember, we import 3,000 metric tons around. And then in 2015, we actually re-export about 3,000 metric tons. But now in the, until the recent until the recent years, it dropped and goes down. So I don't know why, but that's just like the situation. It is what it is. So this is actually the total re-export destination or country or places that from Hong Kong to the to other areas. So it's a lot less. So up to now, 2015 to 2021, there were actually around 22 countries involved. And also actually, but if you look at the volume, Vietnam, like is the highest places to take up. So they take up about 80% of all the re-export from Hong Kong to Vietnam. And then China comes to second, but it's only 6% of the total volume. So just for your reference. And domestic ex export. So what does that mean? Which means like fish of like Yvonne was showing farmed in Hong Kong in, well, either farm or caught in Hong Kong and then they made it by themselves and then to export to other places. So apparently only like, they were very minimal compared to thousand, thousand metric tons for import or re-export and domestic export is always low. I mean, not surprised because we kill everything like all the fish in Hong Kong at the, at the moment. And only in 2019, there was about 60 metric tons and then, in general, is less than 10 or like tons um, for domestic exports. So, which means we mainly look at the total re-export. So as I mentioned, Vietnam is the highest place like for the destination for the dry fish more to be re-export from Hong Kong to that area. And if I took fish more as a case, if I actually look at the shellfin, which is all dry, also dry seafood product, which is Yvonne mentioned, they always have a link. If we look at the dry seafood product re-export data from Hong Kong, actually you see from 2010, the re-export of the dry shellfin or the fins product from Hong Kong will also re-export to um, Vietnam as the top destination to take those things. And not only the shellfin, if I also look at the sea cucumber, how they actually being trade. If you look at the re-export, it's actually earlier in 2004, that was also all the, like most of our sea cucumber product were being re-export to Vietnam rather than to other places. So which means it makes sense, kind of makes sense to me, or also the dry fish more are mainly being re-exported to Vietnam. For the actual reason, nobody knows, but like there are some different way of saying, but we don't have to go into that, but until more study can be done. And back to the country of consignment graph then. So if you remember, re-export at uh, the largest destination is for Vietnam. So which means country of consignment and the, and the third like places when I mentioned is mainly come from Vietnam to Tanzania. What well, uh, sorry, mainly come from Vietnam to Hong Kong, which is overtake Tanzania as well. So one thing we have to bear in mind, some 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 statement actually saying most of dry seafood product are being re-exported to certain places like Vietnam for processing. So, and then if they come back, so which means they finish process and then they will come back. So, which means even when we look at the import, we have to think about that could be a double counting because the fish more being imported into Hong Kong once and then being re-exported to other places for processing and then come back. That would actually... Also, um, it hurts a little bit on the data, but this is something we have to bear in mind when we play the trade data. But at least that could be one of the reasons why Vietnam overtake Tanzania in terms of country of consignment when the shipment comes to Hong Kong. Um, because of the workshop, actually, in general, so the trade data, um, official trade data are normally released in March around by the Hong Kong custom because they have to revise the data according to the previous seizures or like court cases or something. So I actually just literally last week, I went to also look at the 2022 data. So just to give you an idea, so it's pretty much even with, with the 2022 data is around 3000 metric tons of the import coming into Hong Kong. And for the total re-export actually in 2022, so it sort of increased, but I don't know if you can say a lot because 
the definition of law, we like still have to remember, we have to keep monitoring the trade because the pandemic, we don't know what's the effect, but at least in 2022, so there was a little bit of increase of the re-export from Hong Kong to other places. And in terms of um, country composition, so it was very interesting in 2022. So Macau actually overtake Vietnam as the highest like destination in terms of volume, just one year. So, I mean, as Devon mentioned, I think the like obvious link with Macau and the dry fish mall or the luxury for that is the casino reopen. So in 2022, I don't know if they really love more or what happened, but Macau actually like was the highest destination for the 2022. So um yeah, so that's the pretty much um, at the moment the situation. And I it happens that I don't know why. Um I have it happens to be I just got the transportation mode of data for one specific year of the dry fish mall. So I want to try to do more on the transportation data, but it's very difficult because the the way government released data, you have to actually sit in the government office. So because of the pandemic, we couldn't go. But anyway, for the 2018 data, I don't remember how I get it, but this is the official data for how the things using transport, how different transportation coming into Hong Kong. So for the import, most of the fish more dry, remember dry fish more, I actually came from air and also some percentage of what like in the, like through the ocean, like which is the cargo container coming into Hong Kong. And also just for your information, in case you ask, so air, which is the, I mean, plane comes to Hong Kong, land, which is like by truck or by um, train. And then ocean, which is the um, cargo term, like con cargo container, which is from the sea. And for others, you might be curious. So that can be by post. So like delivery or factors or DHL, or that also can be um 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 broad uh, personal individual bringing like through the border. So for example, imagine you arrive at the airport, you have things to declare. When you use things to declare, which means you're personally carrying the stuff like hand carry to Hong Kong, that also goes into the category of others. Anyway, so when you look at the re-export, uh, most of them actually using ocean, like leaving Hong Kong, using cargo container to leave Hong Kong, which is not a surprise because it also in, like, in line with other dry seafood um, transportation. So for example, this is an example, shark fin, how they actually come to Hong Kong from um, all the way, it, like 10 years ago, it's mostly come from the sea and then actually arrive Hong Kong, only minimal actually come from air for the import and also re-export, most of them going to Vietnam. So they mostly go by sea, but for the fish more, it's very interesting. I don't understand why. And I would love to see any kind of interview with the trader. It's like they actually come from air rather than ocean, which is very surprised me because air cargo is always expensive and they're dry product, which means they don't die. So life product, I can understand, but they are dry and that they would actually come through air to Hong Kong. So that's something interesting. I mean, and I also, the other thing, because I only have one year data, I don't know if just an anomaly in 2018 or what happened. So I hope to actually look at the situation more. And coincidentally, when Kim was mentioning about um, the um, secret copper trade, I actually want to show how important is the data. And because we only have 2015 data, we actually can't do what we have done for Sea Cucumber because this is actually what's um, using the trade data from 1996 to all the way to 2014. You can actually see how many countries were involved before and then how they expand. That's, that, that's after 10 years and then up to like now. And of course, the recent data is more than 100 countries. So this, this is the, the beauty of the trade monitoring and the data can actually help you to understand the trade. But for Fishmore, apparently, because we only have data from 2015, and then so we can't see those patterns, how they expand. But keep monitoring data is something that I would happy to see the group or whoever is actually looking at the situation because that would actually help. And especially we have the pandemic um, happening in the past, I, don't, I can't remember how many years, but like just the pandemic. Um, into the future, what we also be interested to actually know from like a researcher based in Hong Kong is I think um, this is actually done for the sharks. And on the left-hand side, something called the Yajin, um, Chen Chi, this is actually the trade category name. So I don't have to go into details because perfect, Yvonne mentioned the trade category. I think Yvonne managed, um, so through her study is not 
this almost the first study only done in Hong Kong is like 2019 to actually look at category using DNA method. So this is an example for the shark fins. They have a specific trade category that help the trader to actually grade them and to find money. And then using DNA, most of the species actually belong to the same category. And But for the fish more situation, we have the trade category, but I think the first question I would like to ask is how many trade categories are actually available in the market that I don't think we actually know for the total number. I think, um, yeah, back to 2019, I think that was a subset sampling. So because all, I mean, like you once said, there may be new species. I also sometimes see new category in the in the, in the the dry seafood market. That's something I'm curious, like how many trade categories are actually there? And each of the trade category, like you once said, are they representing same species? Which is, I'm sure, total Hoppa is. But how about the other species, uh, other category? Are they only one species, 10 species, or how many species in one um, trade category that that large scale DNA work I've never seen in to be done in Hong Kong. So not like sharks that has like done DNA before. So I hope to see that's how they actually find out not only sharks in this, we always call shark fin, but actually some of them from ray fin. So I think, um, so same as the situation, we always think coca is the fish more being used, but, but I mean, obviously it's not, but what else? Um, also, because I'm recently engaged in the regional analyzed data for the fish mall. So I just did the first attempt to get the Taiwan trade data. So just to give you an like just to share a brief background. Um, when you see the trade category, that's the first thing I look at. Uh, sorry, for the Taiwan, it's also lumped together. So basically for the Taiwan data, you can't separate more from other things. So they don't have a specific category for fish more. But still, I also try to play around those data. So you can see, I try to compare the reported imports for the, remember the Hong Kong one is only about the dry um, fish more. So compared to the whole total of Taiwan trade data, which is I add up all these like um, category for fish head, moss, lips, whatever that sounds like a moss, like fish moss, I just add them. So just to give you an idea, so Hong Kong is just like still highest even with the dry fish more. So that's definitely not, um, yeah, something we, we can look at like as a reference. And also, and I hope also, and also when we look at the total export from Taiwan to other places on the fish more trade, which is I also lumped everything together. So you can, that's the first thing you can see. You can see the import volume for reported for Taiwan is low compared to the export. That is also because Taiwan has an extensive fishery. So which means they would also not surprised be having fish more or fish head or fish product inside. So it's not surprised that total export is higher than um, the reported total import, but just for your reference in situation. I hope in the coming month, I might be able to actually look at also Singapore as I've heard. I'm trying to look for the data. I don't know, but I've heard Singapore actually have their own category for fish more. So I will try to actually get those data and try to see, um, compare to Hong Kong and see what's happening. Um, that's something that the regional world, not just Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, I would expect like people can also look for other data and other places to do, to play around those situations like Japan, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore. Well, yeah. And then that's something I hope to see. And the other thing, so I have done a shark fin comparison on the custom data compared to FAO data. And you can see like a lot of FAO data are really nice. Like, like UAE, you can perfectly match the trend and then the theme data. So I don't know if FAO actually have um, more data. So that's something I would also expect people can actually play around with the um, comparison of international data and custom data that in the future. And enforcement and implementation. So I've seen a lot of like shark fin identification guide that to help the government to do enforcement, not only the guide, but also poster. So for the fish mall, I don't think I've seen one that actually is only looking for enforcement or how to identify based on the morphology. Of, or if even if that possible to help, because this is the case of the shafin that I can share with you. So you can see one big bag, one container, each container can have a lot of big bags and then each big bag can have like thousands and thousands of fins. So imagine for the fish more cases, which is thousands of thousands more 
coming like in one bag. So that I think the enforcement people, they need help on how to do the identification, at least to separate I, either morphology. That's something I don't really see in the market. And this is the case. You can see these big bags coming from Peru all the way to Hong Kong. Once in Hong Kong that we're working with the custom, you see on the right hand side, this is the custom opening that white bag. And then you can see thousands and thousands of things that are actually inside there. So they have to use visual identification. They can always use DNA, but I don't know how, like what's the same, like how can you do this, like DNA in, in I, I, thousands of DNA in one go, but I did that. So that's something identification work. I would definitely like, would like to see in the future that helps. And talking about DNA, we actually, because of the shark situation um, in the international level, uh, Florida International University has developed a DNA machine like this, portable DNA machine for helping custom to actually to do implementation for the shark fin things. So in the future, also hope to see that portable DNA machine, I mean, that can help the enforcement for the fish mold. And last but not, but not least, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I'm very happy um, that to share the fish mold. And also people are start talking about fish mold because I think, I mean, first time when I saw the Vakita news some time ago, I mean, everyone is just talking about the Vakita, which is, I totally get it and it's really good. But I was like, but the point is the fish is also critically in danger. Not many people actually talk about the fish and only talk about the Vakita. But now finally people are caring about the quokka and the fish. And yeah, if you have any question, more than happy to help. Um, thank you again. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, organizer ADMCF and also... <laughs> Um, yeah, and Liberty, thank you. Nadia, finally, I can see you. And thank you for all your help. If you, I think Hong Kong can do better. I, I, I hope at least they can do better. If you have any question, feel free to ask me. And here's my email. So um, thank you. Dan, that was um, a very, very comprehensive run through. It was, again, exactly the sort of rich presentation that I think is going to be very valuable for everybody. Um, can we just take a couple of quick questions and um, and then we can have a quick break while we get the other presentation set up. Um, has anybody um, got anything quick for Stan or um, or we can do later? It's, it's really up to you. If anybody has their hand up, we can um, also... Um, um, point to you as well. Excuse me. Um, three more presentations to go through um, before we get to our broader discussion. Um, so our next presenter is uh, Dr. Akalesh from the uh, Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute in India. Um, he's a scientist there. Um, he's been um, he did his PhD on deep sea sharks. He has 16 years experience in fisheries research, um, not only on board um, you know, survey vessels, but doing um, port, um, port surveys and also interacting with stakeholders. He's currently <coughs> involved in research on sustainable fisheries where there's vulnerable fauna and involved and also looking at the impact of demand-driven trade on resources in India's EEZ. He has many other interests in fisheries, including taxonomy, biogeography, fish resource evaluation, ecology, and climate change. And um, so with that, if we could pass over to you, Dr. Akalesh, and really looking forward to hearing your presentation. So, hi all, this is just a uh, basic uh, preliminary outcome from our research uh, from different regions of India. So we have a large team uh, in compared to other percentages, I think. And I work with the CMFRI. Uh, it's one of the largest uh, fisheries research institute in India. So this is already a Professor Sadavi, Dr. San, all the previous Talk, uh, presenters already talked about all these basic informations. I will come back to India. So, as you all know, dried fish products 
I mean, widely used in India from a very long time, centuries back. Uh, we have high value products and also low value products. And, and also India is one of the uh, oldest uh, trade routes in international uh, history. So fish, including dried fish products has been uh, traded historically. And with regard to swim bladder, uh, we can dates back uh, the documentations from 1800s during the, uh, the colonial period uh, about the swim bladder trade. However, the swim bladder trade from India is very old, even older than uh, maybe. Uh, sorry. Yep. Hi, Duncan. Uh, it's just that uh, we thought we'd lost you there for a while. Sorry. Okay. So I was talking about the historical uh, similar train from India. Uh, so uh, uh, to Europe in 1800s, there was a promoted trade for Simbladar, seeing how the Southeast Asian countries are exporting fish more from India, especially Mumbai and Calcutta. So uh, during that period, uh, there was uh, doubt with the European team uh, regarding the quality of the fish moss in 1800s. However, later picked, I picked up uh, some with the support of the uh, British colonial period. And however, uh, in all the documents during this 1700s or 1800s, uh, well mentioned that the uh, trade of fish moss to Southeast Asian countries were there uh, from time immemorial. So the uh, that could be very old one. And uh, the uh, especially the uh, Simbladas from West Bengal, Calcutta was one of the uh, prime type. Uh, and also, uh, it is also not uh, Mumbai or the Calcutta was also the trade route for other regions. So Gulf, Mumbai, uh, China routes are uh, well known in the historic period. So over the period, India was one of the major source countries for Simbladas and uh, the supply chain or the dynamics or the demand drivers for similar is poorly known from country. So as I told earlier, dried fish is one of the uh, prime uh, food item uh, in India, which is uh, in diverse forms, products, it, uh, we can see that. You can see here is a shark dried products. There is a tuna dried called in mass min in luxury. Uh, diverse species uh, dried for fish products and also similar is taken from crocus. So this is uh, uh, this map shows the CMFRI location in person or in infrastructure in the coastal regions of India. So the study was conducted along the uh, large yellow spots, Veravel, uh, Calcutta, West Bengal, Mumbai, and Chennai. These are the prime uh, export destinations for similar. Order. So uh, when come to fishery, there is no major more director fisheries in India. And fishes are mostly caught in its, uh, diverse uh, fishery forms in persians, gillnets, bagnets, diverse forms of fisheries that catch uh, these species contribute into fish mouth trade. However, seasonal targeted fishery for eels are observed in some regions of the uh, west coast and also in the uh, east coast, Bay of Bengal region. Uh, this, uh, the major species forming high price is the crockers, and uh, they occasionally form a uh, high volume catch possibly from aggregations, reasons unknown. And these crockers or the uh, species forming to fish mouth trade mostly come from the northern coast. That is the northern part of the Bay of Bengal and the northern part of the Arabian Sea. So this are just uh, just to show the trades across the uh, region. Some news clippings that uh, this the fish that fetching uh, reaches to news. Like uh, so these are some are from uh, Northern Arabian Sea and uh, some are from the East Coast Northern region. And uh, as I mentioned, historically the trade was spanned across the all India. And uh, in 1800s also the same structure was there. And today also the structure is same. And uh, some regions like Mumbai, Calcutta, Chennai, wherever they still form the major trade hub, hub for similar to train India. Uh, the trade happens in diverse forms. They, uh, there are dried fish exporters association. They support with the support of institution government. They undertake uh, trade. There are online trade, which is mostly high, uh, small size, low price uh, items, which will go in high volume and also from demand based. And the, uh, the major part is that is the uh, large high price or uh, high value prices. The access to information from that group is very limited because they go in a very close network and getting information from that network is very difficult. 
and these are uh, if you search for india uh, fish more trade you'll get a uh, hundreds of online uh, traders who sells the fish more trade from india and these are some activities when fish is landed at the port the fish uh, it is auctioned or sold then the fish more is collected and traded uh, these are also some activities uh, happening uh, at ports there will be high commodity auction at the ports when uh, some high value crockers or eels are landed especially for a uh, black spotter crocker and a uh, large sized eels So once processed, these are locally processed fish moss in India. Uh, uh, these photographs are from Mumbai. They categorize according to sex and also species and also yield. And uh, sex, there is a, a Stan has already uh, mentioned, there is a, a size, sex-based difference in values and everything. And this is just an, showing an example how different regions uh, network in supplying fish moss to major export destination. This is from uh, uh, Gujarat. The species occurring in the region is almost similar. We have uh, threadfins, eels, uh, croakers, and catfish. Uh, the small fish moss are processed or sold at locally. However, the high value process, high value fish moss are traded to major trade hub that is Mumbai. So, uh, low value that is sold in a very low price, and the profit margin is uh, nearly th three to four USD per kg, and uh, these are just uh, how they are taken and uh, sold in market. And in domestic supply chain is very intricate, uh, very complex. Uh, if if the catch or the high value catch is high, it will di uh, directly go to exporter. There will be competitive bidding and in connection with the uh, buyers from uh, foreign countries that they will be online with the agents in India, then the auction or the uh, auction undertakes. So at the uh, Landing center also, there are different categories for buyers for brokers and each uh, at each sector, there will be commission agent who takes profits from uh, second sales. And these are some species uh, which are sold in uh, Indian uh, fish mode trade. Uh, according to size and the according to count uh, to kg, the prices differs and uh, definitely the protonibia that is a black spotter croaker price fetches high and if the largest uh, large uh, larger size species will be getting higher price these are some species which are uh, fetching uh, high value in indian fisheries uh, uh, eels then thread fins then catfish grouper sea bass also used in fish more trade in india so as Professor sadavi mentioned india is one of the top five countries contributing to global trade. And uh, similar to all other luxury seafood items traded from India, the major destinations are Vietnam, Hong Kong, China, and Singapore. Uh, India exports nearly to uh, 26 countries. Uh, Fixmo exports to nearly 26 countries. However, the trends and the volume uh, differs across each region. This is the export trends of uh, Fixmo from India over the years uh, from 2000. Uh, there are some uh, shifts in the volume and also the destination in countries. Uh, the source is Empada, uh, which uh, looks at the India's uh, marine products export. And in 2019, the majority of India's fish more trade was to Vietnam, nearly 92%, overtaking Hong Kong, China, Thailand, which is not the normal uh, fish more uh, importers from India. And there are uh, trades unknown or unknown importer from in, in more trade from India. That is the uh, we have borders with Bangladesh, Myanmar, and also uh, we have regular uh, dried fish trade to Thailand, UAE, and Sri Lanka, and in other forms also. Uh, uh, as mentioned by other uh, presenters, the the so frozen or salted uh, forms that may not be coming into the uh, category of export in dried form. So the volume we may not know actual volume of the fish more trade from India. So this is the uh, FISMO important uh, from the Hong Kong's harmonic system. So over the years, the trend is almost, uh, in 2015, the high volume uh, import was shown from uh, Hong Kong, then decreased, then gradually increasing from 2019 to 2022. However, you can see that uh, 2019, there was high volume import to Vietnam. The trend might have impacted the Hong Kong, Hong Kong trade. So source species. In India, we have a high volume, high diversity uh, fishery, uh, nearly 200 vessels, 200,000 vessels operating in Indian Neosit. 
and the uh, estimates from mainland India shows that nearly 200,000 tons of uh, source species that is potentially belong to crocker family cyanidae eels catfish land in India so this is the estimated land for a source species and this nearly 2000 tons of uh, fish moss were exported from India that is the export trend and with regard to rules and regulations related to fish moss uh, government of India has specialist rules to support the uh, uh, stakeholders in fishery sector uh, to uh, improve their uh, income uh, from the fish moss and we have an export of dried fish moss quality and control rules in 2002 and uh, from 2012 uh, all the exporters must have uh, should declare the fish moss in a specific terms and uh, prior to 2012 the uh, export was mostly going in a dry fish category and still the export category is broad, so there can be uh, some mismatch with the original data. And uh, some images from the government support how it is supporting the uh, fish more. And uh, government want to support the people or stakeholders to increase the income from the, its natural uh, resource. And uh, need uh, it want to ensure the quality and hygiene of the fish most exported from India. So there are regular programs and trainings undertaken. And, uh, there is a guide how to uh, export fish moss and also the quality, hygiene, how to uh, maintain the hygiene, all those guidelines from India. And in conclusion, the demand for fish moss is from uh, uh, other regions and the impact of the uh, global demand on countries are still un undocumented, uh, either with fish moss, shark fin or sea cucumber trade that uh, need to be undocumented. And uh, the fisheries, which supporting the fish more is a multi-species mostly in tropical region and that poses a uh, significant management challenges and uh, in terms of trade monitoring is one of the major challenge and uh, it includes mislabeling and unwill unwillingness of traders to share information so further we need to have more detailed studies uh, from countries uh, in re regional scales and not with the country level studies, but regional style from the export import region or the uh, regions having shared stocks or the shared species and the stock status and promote sustainable fishery. And that's some reference. And thanks. Thank you all. Hey, that was um, really great to, to hear that. Um, I really appreciate um, seeing the FRI being able to to attend and, and um, allow that information to, to, to be brought forward. It certainly um, is an important part of the world in terms of a whole range of fishery products and, and obviously more. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, we can take questions in um, in a couple of ways. Firstly, through the, the Q&A section, um, but then also if any, um, I see a couple of great compliments coming in there for you. Um, but if anybody wants to put up their hand and ask a question verbally, then please do so. Yeah, Dr. Akalesh, there's a, a question to you about whether people in India eat the fish moors. There are some historical documents showing the some people, especially in the Northeast region or the East Coast has consumed fish moss, but the recent, I couldn't find anything, uh, something too recent to support that one. Okay. I, I, I was interested in the exports to Europe. They seem incredibly small and yet it seemed in the um, information I got from the, um, the winemakers, um, India was um, the, one of the major sources. It's either incredibly small volumes going to Europe or um, I mean I, I yeah just need to work out how the the volumes match up yeah that can happen because there may be secondary export after processing in the form of uh, dried fish products and also maybe the uh, declaration may not be in the correct form that that can happen and yeah uh, I saw a question from Yvonne asking what species are the rock cods? 
uh, all the groupers are basically mentioned in uh, as uh, rock chords all the sarani day okay thank you okay well we we might let you off the hook and um we'll move on to our next speaker so again thank you to you okay. and also thank you thank you for giving me an opportunity thank you oh it's fascinating thank you um our next um presenter is uh violin um violin is from <coughs> excuse me he's a phd student at the university of hong kong he started to study croakers uh, from a taxonomic and biological perspective in, in Professor Min's lab at uh, Xiamen University, um, interested in using DNA to identify fish more in the Chinese markets. Uh, that was his master's thesis project. Um, and now that he's doing a PhD, he's continuing to study the diversity, evolution and conservation of croakers on a, on a global scale. So, um, I really appreciate you being able to uh, present today, uh, Bailin. So I shall hand over to you. Uh, how, thank you, Duncan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bayan. My name is Bayan Lin uh, from the University of Hong Kong. I'm so glad to have this uh, opportunity to share our study on understanding the species composition of fish more in China for bird, uh, future trade monitoring, fishery improvement, and ATP species conservation. And this work is uh, supervised by uh, Professor Min Liu at Xiamen University of, Ch uh, of China. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, the presentation consists of five main parts. Uh, I will start with the background. Yeah, uh, uh, a lot. Yeah, the fish maw has long been used for food and medicine in China. Its history can be traced back to more than 2,000 years ago in Han Dynasty, and first with crocus. And also, the fish maw started to tribute to the empire of the Tang Dynasty by Jiangsu province uh, 1,300 years ago. Traditionally, the fish maw uh, was made by croakers and produced mainly in five provinces of China. And the five provinces also covers the distribution of five large size croakers in China. All the five croakers are the traditional maw species in China. Two of them are listed as critical endangered and the population of four croakers is decreasing because of the overfishing of seasonal uh, spawning and overwintering aggregation or intensive fishing pressure on its, its distribution. Um, the large yellow coca is now not a common, uh, not a common uh, fish more species because the large size wild caught individual is very rare and mainly consumed in fresh. And the fatty swim bladder of the farm source is not commonly used for fish maw because it's very time and money consuming for having this fatty bladder. And the traditional maw species in China is overfished, but the demand is increasing dramatically. And so the decline of dramatically produced fish maw in China lags far behind domestic demands. But the development of high sea fisheries and global trade is providing more source on a global scale. And the Chinese immigrants also boost the uh, more source digging, digging and demand on a global scale. A previous study showed that the most imported into Hong Kong and mainland China were from over 100 countries. And it is believed that fish more imported to China from America and Southeast Asia are started in 19th century. For example, the total aba was first imported from uh, Mexican uh, through San Francisco to China in 1915. So in short, there are two sources uh, for Chinese 
fish more markets, the domestic source and the international source. The fish more source from overseas to China are in three forms, ice whole fish and ice fresh swim bladder imported to China for further processing. And also in uh, the uh, fried fish more. In, the, in Chinese dry sea food market, the dry fish more is uh, the most common, it is the most common. While the fresh swim bladder sold in the domestic market are mainly from species caught and farmed in domestic waters, are mainly from eel and catfish and cod. And also the um, dry fish more also uh, processed into instant more products, uh, frozen fish more, and also fried fish more uh, for the market needs in China. Traditionally, the more name always represents specific species. Uh, for cocos, the bai hua jiao, Huang Yu Jiao and Min Yu Jiao is the most common and famous. However, uh, many fish moles nowadays in the markets are labeled as croakers, are often substituted with perch and catfish. And moreover, the swim bladder of fishes in the same genus and family can be very similar, especially for croakers, catfish, and eels. And more, and also more morphology can also be shaped during processing. So nowadays we do not exactly know the species of fish more from their name and morphology by following the same name and morphology in the past. So in uh, in this study, our question is to find out who are they, where do they come from, and we have four objectives in our study. First, to understand the species composition of fish more, to highlight the hotspot areas of the fish more source, to combat the illegal trade of ETP species, to propose strategies for sustainable use of fish more species. So uh, we started our sampling from 2016, and we sampled the fish more uh, mainly from fish more wholesale markets. Uh, of the night cities and online dry seafood stores, fish more traders and governmental uh, department. And when we sampled, uh, at least the one sample on different names and morphology of fish more was sampled, was collected. And we also uh, collected the uh, information of the clear species on, and origin of fish moss. So um, we suggest that the fish more samples in our study represent nearly all fish more from name, morphology, and species in Chinese market. After we got the sample, we used molecular technology to uh, do species ID. And after we have the species list, we collect the species information from IUCN, FAO, uh, peer review papers, reports, and news, and to uh, explore some uh, the story behind them. So, and overall, more than 900 samples were collected from 28 physical retail stores, uh, 13 online stores, four more traders, two personal support, and one governmental department. There are 156 different morphology of more samples from fresh, dry, frozen, and fried were collected in our study. 57 more names were recorded in the market. And Huang Yu Jiao and Min Yu Jiao were the most common name used in the market for the more trade. The declared more origins came across six continents, and 60% were declared from China. 73 species were identified, with 67 at species level, 
five at genus level and one at family level. Nearly half of these species were croaker, and 20% of them were catfish. More than 50% of the species were estuary associated species, and uh, more than 63% of species were large size species. And among the uh, species we ID, 56 species used for more were from wild caught, and only three of them have stable populations. And the populations of 21 species is decreasing. And we still got a lot of uh, data gap from uh, a lot of species in more trade for their population. For the 56 wild caught species, only the cast eel, one species, is uh, under sustainable management in Australia and New Zealand. As we mentioned before, around 60% of species were declared from China. But however, um, this figure actually only like around 10%. Because Around 40% of the species actually from Southeast Asia and 26% were from America. The green circle, so in the, uh, in the map, high, uh, so the highest diversity of fish more, of more uh, species in the trade. Well, our study also found 11 threatened species in the Chinese market. Three are critical in danger. And with two croakers, and two are endangered species with one croaker and one catfish. And we also found six vulnerable species in the more tray of Chinese market. Three are croakers, two are catfish, and one cod. For the uh, protected species, four protected species were found in Chinese more trade. All of them were croakers. Totoaba in Mexico, Chinese Bahaba in China, Otholi Foydus in Vietnam, and Bosmania in Laos. For the decreasing population uh, of more species driven by more trade, uh, from now on, only Totoaba uh, is under wild managed from both uh, wild population and trade. So uh, in 2020, the IUCN red list lists these species as vulnerable from critical in danger. And the management strategies, including MPA, restocking, and combating illegal fishery and trade. The another big cro croaker, Chinese Bahaba, is now still under critical in danger. But the good news is that the artificial breeding was success in 2022 and plan to do restocking this year. Uh, we still need more information about the uh, another two caucus in Vietnam and Laos. So our study have four general conclusions here. Um, first, fish more species are diverse in Chinese market and from all over the world. Caucus and catfish matter in more trade from taxonomy to fishery management. 13 ETB species were found in Chinese more trade. Eight of them are crocus. Southeast Asia, Northeast, South Africa need more attention on more driving fishery management. So at the end, I would like to um, share something interesting with you that here are two examples for farm more species, Cotonibia dicanthus and Nibi dru. The agriculture of the two species are 10 billion in the industrial in China. And the agriculture of these two species are mainly for their swing bladder, while the meats are super cheap and mainly used for ceramic products such as fish, uh, fish ball. The agriculture of the two species are mainly in Southern China, uh, Fujian, Guangdong, Guangxi, and mainly in Guangdong province. Uh, this is the only information we have about the uh, two uh, farming more species. So uh, we still need more information about two 
species in more driving farming. Um, and we are also looking for some uh, funding opportunity to understand more about this. Uh, yeah, and this is all my sharing. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. If you have any question, you can email uh, me. We can email us, uh, uh, me, Bayan, or uh, Professor Min Liu. And yeah, thank you. Uh, <coughs> Uh, thanks very much, Bayan. That was um, really um, interesting to be able to get into that sort of level of detail in terms of the, um, you know, particularly the DNA uncovering, you know, what what species. I, I was amazed by the number of species involved. So I'd, I'd like to sort of open up for questions. And again, um, we can take questions through um, either the Q&A area or if anybody has any direct questions and please put up your hand and um, you can ask questions verbally as well. But while people are thinking of their questions, I have one about the aquaculture. Um, growing mm -hmm. a fish, yeah, growing a fish to 80 centimetres, um, it's it's obviously a, an expensive exercise, and so um, it's obviously the um, the the price of the moor which is making it worthwhile to keep the fish in the water that long to grow. I mean, a, a lot of um, you know fish farmed for food are only grown to a, a couple of kilos. If you look at say barramundi, because the the costs of growing them any bigger than maybe 40 centimetres is too high. Um, it's it's kind of interesting to see um, how the price is also influencing the, the aquaculture grow out. But obviously if it's worth 10 billion um, remimbi a year, then it's um, obviously worth it to somebody. Is there much known about this in terms of the growth of that industry? Uh, but by in is it much known about the growth of the um, farm sector? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yes. Um, actually, uh, we we only have very limited information about the two uh, two species in in, in agriculture. Uh, I think the the industrial is increasing and is expanding, uh, in, and also the farming area is expanding. And uh, firstly, uh, from very limited information source, um, these two species mainly uh, farm in very uh, strict area like southern Fujian province and uh, uh, eastern Guangdong province. And then due to its high value, it, it now extended to uh, along, uh, the, the entire southern uh, coast of China. But we still don't know exactly um, like they are, they are their practice and their their status now. This and um, this the ten billion I and the industrial is um, provided from is is like uh, estimated from the uh, some information the uh, traders and the uh, and the farmers gave us. So it's not uh, actually the accurate number, um, because um, for most of the time the uh, more and the more trade in, in, in China is quite um, strict uh, in some area. And so because the customers for this high price uh, more is not um, very large. So only in, in a very limited area, like uh, several cities in, in, in Guangdong province. So it's very difficult to have a lot of information uh, from them actually. Okay. Um, thank you. There's a, a, a question in the Q&A. Um, are there more import data from Chinese commercial statistics? Uh, yes, actually, uh, there are um, imported data from Chinese commercial statistics, but the same as uh, the situation in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in India, they mixed with the like fish head, fish bone or fish tail together. And 
we don't know exactly the imported products is dry or bad. And so uh, we can, it's very, uh, it's very difficult to find a lot of uh, like useful information from that uh, in imported data about the fish more. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question here. Uh, is aquaculture more price the same as wild more price in terms you know when when you um, compare the same species and size, in other words, the same quality? Yeah, and in 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 more trade, uh, I think the wild uh, individuals, the more from the wild uh, individuals are, uh, are more expensive than uh, farm farm ind individuals because, uh, wire is more better in the in the more trade uh, for the the customs uh, concepts. So and actually, and some for some species, the wild um, the wild more uh, have like a tenfold uh, price than the, the 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 farm individuals for sometimes. Well, wow, that's pretty amazing. Tenfold increase ten times. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can't see, oh, hang on, we may have one more question here. Um, so do you know if the moors that come from specific fish species are tied to a specific industry? For example, are croaker moors for consumption, eel moors used in the beauty industry for, as examples? Ah. Oh, uh, well. Uh... Thanks for your question. I think um, croakers, uh, particularly the high price croaker and the large size croaker are mainly for consumption, particularly for the medicine uh, consumption. While the moss yeah, is also for food mainly. And, but for beauty industrial, I think the catfish uh, are mainly for the beauty industrial because it's quite cheap and can be processed in a lot of uh, morphology and like similar to other expensive uh, uh, crocus species. Ah, very interesting. Okay, we might um, move on. We've got uh, one more speaker to, um, to go today. And um, so I might turn over to, to Michael. Um, so, Michael, are you online? And um, yep, I am. Yeah, I'm, I might just need um Bayan to stop sharing his screen so I can share mine. Okay. Um, and you're um you were having you were saying you might have troubles where you are with your presentation, but is that all okay? Yeah, it's been going remarkably smooth. So I don't want to jinx it, but we should be okay. Okay, I shall hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, just sorry, give me one. Okay, you can hear me okay? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm gonna be talking about a fish more fishery that we've seen develop in Southern Papua New Guinea um, and all the sort of complex conservation issues that have come along with that. And this sort of draws on about eight years of research activity that has been facilitated by Yelani and her NGO, the Piku Biodiversity Network during this time. Okay, so Papua New Guinea lies in the southeast of Asia and encompasses the eastern half of New Guinea and several archipelago islands stretching out into the Pacific. And Papua New Guinea is characterized by low human population density and little commercialized activities compared to the greater Indo-Pacific region. And there's also an abundance of rich riverine and inshore habitat, particularly along the country's southern coastline where human populations are highly dispersed and live by quiet subsistence means. And historically, there'd been very little research on PNG's inshore fisheries. And during a scoping 2014, Will White and John Smart came across two poorly known river shark species. So these species are all threatened on the IUCN red list, 
And this sparked some interest for further research on PNG's understudied river systems in the hope that PNG was acting as a stronghold for these species. So that sort of set the scene for me. I headed into PNG in 2017 to start my PhD. And the task was essentially to locate sawfish and river shark populations and provide an indication on their population status. So I spent about eight months, all up over two and a half years, traveling around far-flung corners of PNG, looking for these species, digging through piles of shark fin, and documenting sawfish rostra along the way. And a big part of this research was understanding the local uses and values of sharks and rays in the regions I visited, as well as characterizing the small-scale fish and to put a long story short, it was quite successful in the end. So these dots essentially represent sites where sawfish or river shark observations were made. And we found that the many rivers feeding into the Gulf of Papua appeared to be really important habitat that were supporting higher densities of sawfish and river sharks compared to the broader Indo-Pacific, excluding parts of Northern Australia. <clears throat> However, while Papua New Guinea was acting as a stronghold, fisheries-induced declines were evident. For example, two-thirds of fishers interviewed reported decreases in sawfish catch in their lifetimes, and estuarine and inshore gillnet fishing pressure was very clearly the cause. And throughout these surveys, the driver of gillnet fishing efforts slowly began to emerge. So with increased frequency, we began seeing fish moors being dried alongside the usual spread of shark fin, and clotheslines were being repurposed into fish moor drying stations. So we wrote up this work and told the story of this sawfish and river shark stronghold that appears to be at, at great risk to the fish moor fishery that seemed to come out of nowhere and take remote PNG communities by storm. And since 2020, we've really focused on this fish moor fishery as we're scrambling to provide fisheries managers the information they need to develop a management plan. So I'm going to run through a paper that we've just submitted that covers the development of the fish more fishery in the Gulf of Papua and the immense conservation challenges it now presents. So Kikori Town is sort of the beating heart of this fishery and the main centre of commerce for the sparsely populated northwestern Gulf of Papua region. And Kikori is also where Yolani, who's the lead author on this paper, has been working with local resource users for the last decade which has allowed us to get a really gain a good understanding of how this fishery emerged and is operating. So before fish maul was a commodity in the Gulf of Papua, fishing was mainly a subsistence practice with some catch sold at the Kikori town market. And at the time, fishers were mainly targeting small bodied species such as these nursery fish, as well as small size classes of some of these larger bodied species here in the table. And something to note here is the price of Nibia squamosa down the bottom with a value of about one USD per fish in 2012. And around 2014, 15, two commercial buyers of fish products emerged. And it was around this time that things began to change. So subsistence type fishing methods, such as trailing a baited hook behind a paddle canoe or use of cheap or makeshift gill nets started to turn into engine powered boats being used to set four to six commercial grade gill nets at a time. During surveys in 2018, we started to learn that much of was being supplied by commercial fish buyers in leasing arrangements where loans would be repaid in fish more under agreements between commercial fish buyers in certain villages. And these leasing and sale agreements continue presently. So at the time in 2018, we were looking at shark and ray bycatch in this southern region, we observed 37 species in the fishery, with 64% of individuals coming from species assessed as threatened on the IUCN red list. Though overall, just over 50% of observations were river sharks or sawfish alone, with Glyphus garakai being the most observed species. However, I will point out that these stats, along with shark fin, also include sawfish rostra, which have a bias for being kept longer than shark fin, as rostra are typically not sold, but retained for decoration in the fisher's house. So looking at some data collected by fisher enumerators over a period of about one month, we found that catch recorded at the Kikori River Delta, uh, Glyphus made up 62% of catch, 
while three species of sawfish were also caught in low numbers. Then the bottom graph was in the upper delta of the Fire River, and here glyphus accounted for 85% of catch. And during this time, it was noted that the scaly croaker, or stonefish as it's locally called, was the highest valued species with one kilo of dried fish maw worth up to 2,900 USD. And that price is first point of sale. So that's what the fishers are receiving from these commercial fish businesses. And these stonefish are not particularly large. They have a maximum size of about 75 centimeters, though they do appear to have very large, thick bladders. And this was an image taken in 2019 where things had got to the point value in meat and fishers were essentially finning any shark catch, harvesting the moors from teleos and disregarding the rest. So outside of major townships, there is no electricity, which means no refrigeration. So dried products such as shark fin and fish moor that can be remotely harvested, dried and stockpiled are very compatible to the challenges of everyday life in Papua New Guinea. Okay, so things slowed down during COVID, though in September 2021, the National Fisheries Authority announced a closure to new license applications for fish more in the Gulf and neighboring Western province, citing the occurrence of illegal, unregulated and unreported activities. And this closure is in place until a management plan is developed. At the time of the closure, six companies in the Gulf province were associated with fish more, and collectively, there were 15 active buyer licenses. Interestingly, each of these companies are owned by East Asian expatriates, while licenses under these companies are mostly local community members. It's also notable that most of the companies presently engaging in fish more trading were licensed between 2017 and 2019. And this included the opportunistic adaptions of several general store or hotel companies. Since the closure, a further two companies have emerged, and it's unclear if these are franchises or new licenses granted. So over the 2021-22 season, we managed to get back into the field. And this time we wanted of species within the fishery. So we selected five villages to each record soak time and, and catch for one net per fishing trip. And what we found was that villages on the coastal fringe of the Delta only fished within their customary lands, while fishers from Babio village, which is the pink star just below Kikori town, leveraged family relationships to fish with communities down near the coast where most of the fishing effort occurs. And this was the overall patch of the fishery monitors for a single net each from November through to March. Overall, 51% of catch were teleosts, while 49% were elasmobranchs. The main target species, Nibia squamosa and Barramundi, which is late scale carafa, made up 22% of the catch. And there was some confusion with one, one of the groups of fishers that ended up recording all of their shark and ray catch from October to March, which gave some really good insight into the volume of incidental catch from a single group of fishers within just one of the many villages. So this group of fishers landed just over 1,100 elasmobranchs, 97% of which were individuals from species listed on the listed as threatened on the IUCN red list. Winghead sharks accounted for 74% of catch and dominated landings every month. And alongside these catch surveys, we also conducted a local knowledge survey of dolphins in the area. So Dr. Isabel Beasley has been working on the Kikori River dolphins for a few years now. And from her work, it seems the mortality rate in this fishery is exceptionally high and raising serious local extinction concerns. And we know from conspecific populations in Australia, these species typically hang out in small subpopulation clusters. So 74 animals in a year is really concerning. Interestingly, interviewees in our local knowledge surveys didn't really report overwhelming declines in dolphins. However, we suspect this is due to the high current catch rates being perceived as an abundant population, or that there is a shifting baseline phenomenon occurring as most fishers interviewed started fishing full time within the last five years or so with the development of the fish more fishery. 
And from these local knowledge surveys, we also found that when it came to gillnet fishing, there was a bit of a set and forget type practice. So soak times reported had a median of five hours, although in a subsequent question, all fishers reported the soaking of gillnets overnight. So in the context of our threatened species bycatch, long gillnet soak times where nets are virtually unmonitored mean that most catch is dead on gear retrieval. Okay, so just as we began these 2021-22 surveys, the first point of sale price post-COVID had risen to 12,000 US per kilo for large dried Nibia squamosomore. And by the following July, the price had continued rising to a maximum value of just over 15 and a half thousand USD per kilo. And we actually got this price from a public notice board at one of the commercial fish buyer businesses. On the same board, they had meat value, which was equivalent to 60 cents US per kilo. So this really underlines that fish more is driving this fishery. And the Kikori region is recognized as an important marine mammal area by the IUCN. And it's really the only place outside of Australia where multiple sawfishes are persisting. And this region would qualify for several of the newly launched important shark and ray areas criteria. So the key conservation message here is that this fish more fishery is really undermining the biodiversity heritage value of the region, which is a significant threatened species stronghold within the Indo-West Pacific. And the huge consideration for development of conservation and management initiatives in this fishery, for the local people, Fishmore has really alleviated some quite severe poverty issues that existed prior to the fishery developing. So while local fishers acknowledge sustainability and threatened species concerns, the overarching feeling is that everyone is pretty happy for now. Whether Fishmore money is going back into community and human development remains to be seen, and this is sort of our next research focus. Okay, and to finish up, we wanted to try and contextualize PNG's contribution to the global trade of fish more. So we looked at three databases, the FAO, Hong Kong CSD, and UN Comtrade. And the important thing to note here, um, as has been risen in other talks, is that only Hong Kong CSD has a fish more specific commodity code. So the FAO data was just ex exports of the amalgamated fish more commodity to all countries. And the Hong Kong CSD data was imports from PNG. Then we looked at imports from PNG by Hong Kong and Singapore on the UN Comtrade database also. As from the FAO partner country export data that was available, we could see that while most product was going to Hong Kong, there was some products going to Singapore also. And the volume value ratio for Singapore was similar to Hong Kong, indicating that it probably was also fish more. Okay, so this was the trade volume and value data for PNG. So I'm just gonna focus on the main things here. So firstly, we saw a 600% increase between 2017 and 2018, which corresponds to the period where most fish more trading licenses emerged in our PNG study site. We generally saw variable congruence between PNG's exports and the import databases. For example, value corresponded for 2014 through to 2017, and again in 2019, and in some years, the volumes also corresponded. Although there were a few odd things. For example, in 2015, 17 tons of the amalgamated fish more product was imported into Hong Kong, according to the UN Comtrade database. Although this wasn't reported in FAO or the Hong Kong CSD database. However, the import value between Hong Kong CSD and the UN Comtrade did match up for 2015. So it's not exactly clear what the story is here. Then in 2018, there was no import volume reported for Hong Kong in the UN Comtrade data, though value was reported. However, there was still a discrepancy in PNG's reported exports and the import volumes. So looking into this discrepancy, we found that in 2018, Australia imported 12 tons of the amalgamated fish more products, according to the UN Comtrade database 
Although again, this was absent in the FAO data. And the value of this Australian import was only about 25,000 USD, indicating that it probably wasn't fish more. And finally, these prices um, across these databases do not match the value of more that we are seeing on the ground. And there's a range of potential reasons such as tax evasion, et cetera, that may explain this. Although as is characteristic of the global fish more trade, we really don't know what's going on here. So while there's a bit more to unpack within that graph, the main point I wanted to illustrate is that it's very difficult to reconstruct trade of fish more from FAO and UN com trade databases due to the amalgamation of fish more with other fish products. And this amalgamation is because commodity codes were developed based on products that drive fishery production and trade, which historically has not been considered the case for fish more. However, as is the case in PNG, we are now seeing fisheries emerging that are being driven by fish more, which has a higher value than meat. So the amalgamation of fish more with other products is not appropriate for the present global fishery landscape. So there's possibly an opportunity for international fisheries production and trade databases to consider a fish more specific commodity code, as this will greatly assist in identifying emerging fish more fisheries and would assist in their management, as well as our general understanding of international drivers of fisheries. And positive benefits may also be achievable Appendix 2 of CITES can be traded when accompanied with export permits issued by the exporting country that indicate legal acquisition and non-detrimental harvests to the population. So given the extinction risk for a number of species harvested for international trade of their fish moors, they may meet listing criteria for CITES Appendix 2. And this could be an effective policy tool to facilitate improved management and monitoring of fish more fisheries and would likely have positive flow and effects for incidentally caught threatened species, particularly low income nations presently lacking in management. For example, in PNG, the targeting of Nibia squamosa for international trade of fish more appears to be facilitating the capture, harvest, and trade of fins from a number of species listed on society's appendices. For example, here we have sawfish, wedgefish, winghead sharks, and carcharinids that are all having their fins harvested for sale. And we know shark fin doesn't have an end use in PNG. So I know CITES listings can be complex and can divide opinion, as we recently saw for the carcharinid listing. Um, but I think it's something that definitely needs to be tabled for discussion in the context of fish more. So ultimately, the global fish more trade represents a complex challenge, though East Asian demand for luxury dried seafood products is a sustainability and conservation challenge that has arisen many times before. So it's likely that lessons can be learned from international trade management of other products to set in motion policy and management actions that will facilitate sustainable harvest of fish more and conserve species that are incidentally caught in these fisheries. Um, so a big thank you to the study co-authors, in particular Yelani, um, and to Save Our Seas, who have funded this work for the last sort of six years, and Sprat also funded our most recent surveys. So happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank, thanks, Michael. That was um, <laughs> quite quite a sobering presentation in terms of yeah, the, the 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 rubber hitting the road and the sort of conflict between um, you know poverty alleviation and and some of these at risk species. It's a, it's a real dilemma. Um, I'm glad your um, internet connection has um, stood up. So um, yeah, I'd like, like to open the floor to questions. Again, we can get questions through the uh, Q and A button, uh, but also people can. Um, put up their hands and ask questions specifically. So um, <clears throat> maybe while people are having a bit of a think about that, the um, I, this whole question about, you know, does trade actually help the management or, um, or not um, is a, it seems to be a sort of compelling one. And as you said, um, you know, the fishermen, 
and the communities are seeing the financial benefits in a in, you know in, in in their lives when you know things are pretty um poor normally um i mean what's the is there any um uh, yeah, I'm sort of struggling to understand what the solution is in some of these circumstances um, and whether putting in better trade documentation is really going to have much an impact, to be honest. Yeah, look, it's it's the million dollar question. Um, there's a there was a paper, I can't remember when it was published, 2009, called Wicked Problems in Fisheries Management. Um, and I think a lot of these fish more fisheries really fall into that context where you know it's just very difficult to come up with management solutions um that you know in low-income countries aren't impeding i guess the economic opportunities of the local people that have you know really um sort of had the short end of the stick for a long a long time so it's um However, in PNG, there used to be a shark longline fishery um, that would land a lot of things like silky sharks, thresher sharks, oceanic white tips. Um, and in 2013, um, I think silky sharks and oceanic white tips were listed on CITES Appendix 2, which meant that for that shark longline fishery to keep operating, they had to be able to demonstrate non-detrimental harvest, which was impossible. Um, so that fishery actually closed a year later. Um, so that is an example of how an international trade agreement, um, I guess, overcame a fishery that was sort of clearly extremely unsustainable. Um, so there are other situations like that that have occurred globally. Um, not a whole lot of them, admittedly, but you know that they, they there is value at, at looking at these trade protections and regulating trade because um, what it does it forces countries, the exporting country, to um, set up a management framework that allows them to monitor the status of that fishery. Um, so that's that's sort of what the objective is, I think, with CITES Appendix Two. Yeah. Yeah, we, we'll get a lot more into the whole management stuff um, um, tomorrow. Um, yeah, but it's a real dilemma. Um, mm. So I'm just checking to see whether anybody's got any specific questions for you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if not, that brings us to the end of the um, sort of formal presentations um, today. And but we do have um, some time for discussion. So I, I've been making notes over um, the, 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 the course of the evening. We've had like five really great presentations. So um, Michael's one just recently, um, fascinating about you know, what's happening on the ground and, and the endangered species interactions. Um, we've had um, Bayan's presentation um, looking at tracking the um, you know what's actually being sold using DNA and uncovering a wide variety of species. Um, we had um, Dr. Akalesh looking at the um, the um, supply and of um, swim bladders in India and also you know noting just how um, long established the the use of swim bladders has been. Uh, particularly in in Asia more widely, um, Stan um, got into the detail of the Hong Kong trade um, in and, and particularly sort of drew, drew some analogies between um, other high value products, particularly um, shark fins, and then Yvonne started the the evening or the day um, with a great overview of. Um, the variety of products and what's been known from the past studies in the in the trade. Um, I noted I noted a few questions on the way through. One of them was about um, you know, has anybody noticed any changes in in consumer attitudes? And it was interesting to hear comments about um, the shift out of um, um, shark fins in in some communities. Um, there were also you know, questions about, you know, 
the export and and it basically exporting the value to be um, processed or the you know the 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 benefits to be um, accrued in other countries where the processing takes place. Um, and I and I guess that sort of dovetails back into your presentation, Michael, about you know the um, the, the you know, trying to capture financial benefits at a local level. Um, so yeah, I, those were some notes that I made. And there's obviously a lot of questions about the um, identification questions um, and the ongoing um, questions about the identification um, of, of moors and also being able to track the trade. Um, so I sort of open it up to people to, um, um, you know, being able to, to 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 contribute on anything on um, today's session and um, and maybe raising some things that we can cover um, tomorrow. Kim, I see you have your hand up, so please. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me. I'm sitting in a busy airport. Um, thanks very much for the the last talk. I think that this is kind of getting to the crux of our presentation tomorrow on international assistance that we can bring to local problems like this, especially when we're talking about low volume, high value products from very remote areas and the, the probably the inequalities that are, are, are sort of embedded in the multilateral environmental agreements and the fishery management world. And I'd be interested to ask, you know, what was their experience of fisheries management or any management in those regions? Because in reality, we do understand that high value, low volume products are going to find their way to market anyway. Um, we struggle bringing fisheries management to very remote areas that are, you know, do not have the capacity to, to deliver any type of fisheries management and then bring in the belief that suddenly we're going to bring in a higher level of authority coming from an environment department who's going to, who's going to fill that gap. But in reality, I would imagine in their experience running up and down those river systems, there's no capacity there either. So I uh, just like to get some vision from yourselves. What 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 are we seeing down there in in, in PNG that that gives hope for any kind of bottom up approaches apart from coming in from the international level that we'll discuss tomorrow? Sorry, long question. Yeah, no, it's um. Yeah, as I said before, yeah, it's it's truly a wicked problem. Um, yeah, look, bottom up management. Um, so Yolani, who I mentioned, who's lead author basically of the story I just told, um, and her NGO, they they're in a very unique position where they've got really outstanding um, social capital, I guess, with the local fishers. Um, so yeah, the, the hope is that the next, I guess, phase of our research is to start poking at, you know, ways we can sort of manage this from, from the bottom up. Um, but yeah, look, it's really challenging talking top down management in nations like PNG. Um, Cause in reality, there's just, you know, bigger human systemic issues to deal with almost. Um, and the resources just get allocated elsewhere. So it's, um, no fault of PNG and the National Fisheries Authority by any means. Um, but yeah, look, it's, it's, I, I don't really have a, an answer for you. It's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something international, um, I guess, you know, whether bingos or broader NGOs can, you know, come in to help build. um but yeah like it's it's a it's an immense problem that really only over the last 12 months that we've got our heads around you know the magnitude and the value and things like that so it's um yeah a moving piece at the moment i'll say um thank you very much we'll we'll get a chance to discuss that tomorrow but just to give you the heads up even in western australia where we've got lots of money it's very hard to stop the trade in abalone, the illegal trade in abalone. So uh, I'm sure Jeff Kinch is on this call. A lot of experience in PNG can talk to the struggles they've got of, of delivering management in remote areas of PNG. But uh, mm. we're, it'll be an interesting discussion tomorrow, hopefully. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll just add too. There was a, a question in the Q&A. Um, someone was talking about trade 
um, from PNG into Indonesia. Um, so I, it was something I just didn't have quite quite have time to fit into the talk. Um, so Sarah Busalachi, who I think was uh, in on this call, um, she she did some really interesting work along the sort of the PNG Indonesia border along the south coast there, and they her team they they reported. I guess, fish more trade across to Indonesia and a little bit to Port Moresby as well. But the, the prices were incredibly low compared to what we were seeing in the Gulf of Papua. Um, and it remains unclear, you know, whether that's a symptom of, of different markets. So maybe there's a really direct, you know, from Gulf of province to Hong Kong market that exists there, um, whether in the Western province, there might be a bit more of a prolonged market chain that sort of jumps through Indonesia and um, gets to Hong Kong that way, um, whether it's just simply a different species type of issue. However, Nivea squamosa does also occur in the Western province. Um, so it's, it's really complicated. It's really dynamic. There's clearly several market chains for fish more out of PNG. And like you said, you know, it's a, a low volume, but yeah, in some cases, high value, and we're still seeing that much, I guess, of a dynamic nature to it. So it's, um, yeah, a bit of a hands in the air sort of um, scenario, but, you know. <clears throat> right, thank <coughs> thanks. And, and also, thanks, Kim, for that question. And the, um, yeah, we've got a lot to think about um, tomorrow. I, I see a comment from, from Jeff about how economic opportunities will override sustainability for poor people and i guess that's the the nub of the um the dilemma that's that's being faced um <clears throat> sorry i'm just sort of struggling with this sore throat um yeah i just wanted to we've got um some time if people want to discuss um broader issues arising from um, the presentations um, today, in in addition to Michael's, and um, yeah, but if if, um, if people are wanting to, to 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 log off, then quite happy to um, to do so. Um, so there is a I just saw a question coming through from um, National Fisheries Authority in um, PNG. Michael, can you see that? It's from Matilda. It's not in the Q and A area. It's in the chat area. Uh, in the chat. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I guess this is a bit more of a um, in-house PNG conversation that's been going on. Um, so yeah, Matilda. Look, um, Yolani Amapu, who I'm sure you're aware of, is the person to get in touch. But yeah, we're we're very happy to. Be working with NFA. Um, I, th I think Yamani actually gave NFA a presentation. It might be some months ago now. Um, but yeah, we are have an open dialogue with NFA as far as I'm aware. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, Michael, we might let you off off the hook. It's, it was fascinating. I'm really pleased that you. Um, got in contact and, and put this presentation forward because it's um, just fascinating how diverse things are from, you know, what your experience on, on the ground and also what Brian spoke of and Elizabeth spoke about yesterday. <clears throat> and then also different experiences in India and other places. So it's, um, I, I don't think there's any going to be one simple big bang solution here. So, um, yeah. I feel sorry for all those sawfishes and other things, though. <laughs> Pretty cool animals. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, so if, if nobody's got any further questions or contributions, um, happy to, to log off and we reconvene tomorrow um, at the same time. So 9 a.m. CET time, I think. Uh, oh, Michael, you just put up your hand. Sorry, yeah, I, I do have a a question. Uh, I'm not sure it's really a question or more of a comment, but um, <clears throat> I was wondering if anyone has any knowledge about, I guess, um, 
historic or aged moors. Um, so I, I have a friend from Hong Kong at James Cook University. She's a geneticist. And one night we jumped on Facebook Marketplace and we we're just looking at the value of fish more. And, you know, she was scrolling through. Um, and something that came up was like, it, it appears that there's sort of, you know, particular families will buy a expensive moor and keep it for decades and, you know, occasionally shave bits off it for um, sort of custom type uses. Um, and I, I just have never read or seen anything, I guess, in Western literature that kind of talks about, yeah, that that phenomenon of, of buying a more and almost investing in a more, like it seems that families sort of buy a more and yeah, or keep it for decades and age it and, yeah, I'm just wondering if anyone has any further information on that. Can I, um, Duncan, can I do yeah. a partial response to that, if you can hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, hi, Yvonne here, uh, Yvonne Sadovi. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's very interesting. I think one of the interesting things about more and the dried seafood products generally is that they can be stored for quite a long time. And that does give an opportunity for sort of investment and speculation and these kinds of things. So, you know, the, the pricing here uh, is, is obviously very important. Um, you can wait until there are good prices on the market and sell or, or, or whatever. So with the dried products, um, your specific question is, yes, in Hong Kong, we have seen that um, there are examples of um, uh, there are the, when when we interviewed traders, older more had higher value. So there was sort of like wine in a way that was mm. uh, quite a strong indication of certain species though. So this isn't kind of generally the case, but of the more valued species, and I guess the bigger, thicker more, there was certainly quite a strong indication that that does occur. So what you have heard about families and giving at special occasions and those kinds of things, I can echo that from mm -hmm. our experiences um, here in Hong Kong. Yeah, okay, that's, that's really interesting. And, and I guess it led me to the thought that, um, you know, what what are we potentially missing by only looking generally, at, I guess, Western literature sources? Do you think, like, is there much, um, I guess, local language uh, information on Fishmore um, that we potentially need to be looking into from your perspective? Um, well, certainly in, when I was based in Hong Kong, so I was based in Hong Kong for a number of decades and, and now I'm in the UK, but in Hong Kong, we did look at all the literature we could. And when I say we, um, with my students at the University of Hong Kong, they also looked at the Chinese language literature. And what we could dig out from that very specifically was the story, which we published, um, the story behind the Bahaba Taiping, Taiping Ensis. And how and, and it's and it's history, but and that came from the Chinese literature that was translated by students. So there was quite an interesting and rich history there. Um, there are some papers in English, um, but um, from quite a long time ago with some of the history, like from Lin, for example, 1939. Um, but certainly maybe more more uh, more translations might be available. And maybe, I don't know, Bayan, if you're still there um, within mainland China, whether there's um, literature uh, that, you know, has been overlooked and, and, and that, 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 you know, we could bring into this. So, yeah, thank you. I think that that's an important question. You mean uh, looking for the uh, the age of the fish more in, in um, mainland China? Um, I, I, maybe that, but also what I understood from um, Michael's question was, is, you know, a lot of the literature that gets reviewed in the published papers tends to be English language literature. So mm -hmm. is there more um, in the mainland, for example, Chinese language literature on the history, production, use, importance of fish more? So are we missing literature, I think is what, what I understood from Michael. Oh, yes. I, I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the, uh, like uh, material from very very old material, like uh, one thousand, um, just like one thousand years ago, or or several hundred years ago in in the mainland China, uh, uh, just like um, describing some information about the 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 crocus more, 
but uh, and mainly for their, their their food and usage and uh, particularly for the uh, medicine for uh, using as Chinese medicine, but um, very limited information from the like source and processing and also uh, other uh, others. Yeah, and, and, and am I am I answer your questions or? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you have. Um, I, I suppose my follow up is um, it seems that I think, um, Yvonne, you had mentioned this in your talk that Fishmore is potentially replacing or starting to replace shark fin as sort of the go to, you know, wedding feast or ceremonial cuisine. Um, I think that's really interesting. And, um, and I suppose that's kind of ties into the type of um, kind of lost information I guess we may not be getting in the Western literature is that more of the cultural or social aspect um, that Fishmore has in those types of practices because um, yeah it'd be it'd be really good to sort of get you know a bit of quantification or um, or qualitative um, further information on on that phenomenon of Fishmore sort of starting to replace shark fin. Could I make a quick comment on that, Duncan? Um, just um, that that's a very important point. So the replacement situation specifically is, is really relatively recent. And, and this happened specifically in Hong Kong. And it happened after some really amazing campaigns um, about shark fin. And a lot of young people are now having, I think they call them green weddings, and opting not to use shark fin. So it's opting not to use shark fin because of the shark fin campaigns. So if you mm -hmm. don't use shark fin, you need something else that's valuable to replace it. And more amongst other valuable uh, seafood, for example, has been, uh, has been selected sometimes. And actually, I just want to make a point I was thinking to make earlier is, and I think this is just a really good example where we do have to look at the bigger picture with all of these things. You know, often when there's conservation campaigns or fishery campaigns, we'll look at a very specific issue, you know, change the gear type. Um, let's not take this um, species because they're threatened. But actually, we have to always keep a, at least one eye on the bigger picture because there's going to be a knock on. Things aren't just going to disappear. Some, it's going to press out somewhere else. And I think that this particular situation where more is one of the things that has increased in use because of a really successful campaign, in my opinion, in Hong Kong about shark fin is one of those bigger picture situations. So the bigger picture here is the luxury seafood trade. We have to keep an eye on the bigger, the bigger part, bigger, bigger picture. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for dealing with my questions and I'll shut up now and let someone else talk, but thank you. Oh, no, I think it was a very useful discussion. And um, I mean, certainly, I think um, Yvonne's observation about, um, you know, the potential consequences of a focused campaign sort of erupting somewhere else is something which we see a lot of in, in fisheries. Um, yeah, I see um, a comment from um, Sandra, who's from Malaysia, saying that she's seen the same pattern for Chinese dinner receptions where people have stopped using shark fin and switched to fish more. Um, it's, there's obviously lots of um, drivers here, um, you know, whether it's poverty at the fisher level or cultural things which are driving it. So, um, so there's a question there from uh, Dr. Akalesh saying, I wish to know, if there's any historical account of fin and fish more trade from India prior to 1800. <clears throat> not, not seeing too many um, People putting up their hands there, Dr. Akalesh, uh, might be something you might have to um, follow up. But um, yeah, and, and maybe if you could change your questions to everyone rather than just to hosts and panelists and, and also Rekha, um, reckon they're the same. Um, you may end up with um, a sort of broader range of people who can, can help you with some of these questions.
just one comment about an earlier suggestion about the MSC. There's, uh, there was a mention, I think it might have been in Jeff's, uh, sorry, in Michael's presentation about um, um, the, uh, what, what we call Ling in Australia or Cuskeel um, from Australia and New Zealand um, being used for more. And you see those, you see fish moors from those two, from those species advertised and there's fisheries in both Australia and New Zealand, which are MSC certified. Um, so, you know, potentially there's sort of sustainable sources there, but again, um, very, very small volumes. If, if I can just make a quick comment on MSC, um, there was time to come around. So something with MSC is that, um, I'm not flagging MSC by any means. Um, however, it, it's often very target species specific. Um, so there are MSC certified fisheries that have incidental catch problems that are certainly not sustainable or good or you know moving in a positive direction. Um, so yeah, I'm not saying MSC is a a, a dead end in terms of exploring it for fish more sources um, but it's certainly not going to be a silver bullet for the broader issues that come along with fish more fisheries yeah I, I mean like a lot of these things i don't think there's any silver bullet um it's going to be a mixture of things so I, I just wanted to pass that on that there are those sources there okay so last call for anybody have any further things they want to to raise um I th yeah there's a couple of comments from reckon there about might be worthwhile having a study of some of the campaigns which have been run to look at what works and and what doesn't and maybe taking some learnings from say the shark fin campaign um to see whether there's any learnings that could be applied in in other areas i think that's a really useful suggestion <clears throat> yeah jeff's comment about a grouper campaign in in fiji hi duncan um can i add some uh, in, some, sure. uh information about a more campaign um for the total Alba. actually um in 2018 or, or seems like that time um the u.s government and the chinese government launched a campaign to uh combat the uh, illegal trade of total aba between uh mexico uh, to china or uh, u.s to to china or hong kong yeah and i think it's very successful and and can be and can be an um, uh, example for other more species uh, uh global trade because um, after that time, uh, the Chinese government uh, paid very uh, a lot of uh, like money and like uh, 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 people to uh, focus on the total aba trade, illegal trade into China. So uh, a lot of like uh, more than billions, uh, like billions uh, values of the total aba uh, more what. Uh, were like were filed in the illegal trade in, in China. And then after that, very limited to the more uh, like imported uh, to China. And now, so I think maybe the so example of the total ABBA can be, um, can be, can be learned uh, for other more species in the future. Great, Th thank you. Um, yeah, there seem to be a number of campaigns um, I mean, certainly in the past, there was, remember, the take a pass, pass on sea bass. There was the um, give swordfish a break. There's been quite a number of of um, campaigns over, over the years. And um, so maybe having a, a review of what's been successful um, and what might be the, the lessons learned is a good idea. Okay, so um, 
Yeah. Um, I, 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 I note Dr. Akalesh's question about um, the trade in some of these high value fish products from India prior to 1800. Um, so maybe if somebody has that sort of information, then maybe contacting him directly um, would be would be worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, so I'm going to make a last call for any comments. I'm starting to see some people dropping off. Um, so unless there's any anything um, that people want to raise in the last few minutes, then um, quite happy to to let everybody go. And as I said, tomorrow we start again at nine Central European time for our last session. Um, we have five speakers again tomorrow, um, and the focus will be on the, the management side of things. So um, looking forward to seeing everybody um, again tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks to everybody for the speakers too. Thank you.